Dear friends and family in Christ, may you hum- be humbled by the great truth that Jesus has conquered sin, death, and the devil, and he's done so for you. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. O oh Lord Almighty, we thank and praise you for the precious gift of salvation that you have given us. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the generosity of your love that you pour out on us. Lord, we pray that each and every day that we would be humbled by the sure truth that you have entered into this world, that you have conquered death for us, that we have the promise of eternal life because you have risen and conquered the grave. Lord, help us to each day to live as your children, being faithful to your word. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. As some of you, probably most of you know that when I was in high school, I enjoyed playing sports. I started out playing football, and I also played uh, wrestled as well. Now, with football, as many of you know, it's a team sport, so you know if something goes well, you celebrate as a team. If something doesn't go so well, well, you can maybe uh, maybe it's not everyone's fault, or maybe it's someone's fault. But there's not as much individual. Uh, it's not as individual as wrestling. Now, wrestling, while it's a team sport, it's also more of an individual sport. It is a wrestler that you have to work hard. If you want to do well, you need to condition well. If you want to learn, then you need to make sure you learn. Well, as a wrestler, I always enjoyed wrestling. I never was a great wrestler. I wasn't a bad wrestler. I was just kind of mediocre. My junior year, I made it to regionals. But, you know, what? one of my matches stands out to me. It was a match that I wrestled my senior year. It was a short match. Maybe that's why it stands out so well to me. I remember it was a team tournament, so every team puts up one person for each weight class going up. And, well, I was on the higher end of the weight classes, and I watched as one t- teammate after the next pinned a guy and then, or beat, it, beat another guy. It got to be pretty close to me. My buddy Jim, he came up. He pinned a guy in 13 seconds. The next guy was my buddy Matt. He pinned a guy in about 30 seconds. That maybe was a little longer than that. So it was my turn. Pretty short in between. I was ready to wrestle. I was ready to go. I shook the guy's hand. I knew right away I was going to win this match. See, he had a real limp and a weak handshake. And I knew that generally, if that was what the case, that I was going to win right then and there. Well, I got out there on the mat thinking, well, if they did it in 30 seconds and 13 seconds, I'm going to do it in 20 seconds. And I go and I lock the guy up in a head and arm. I get ready to throw, throw him. And suddenly, and you guessed it, I'm, things did not go so well. In fact, the match was a short match. It was less than a minute, and I was pinned. Pride cometh before the fall. Or in my case, pride cameth before the pin fall. Yeah, uh, I don't particularly like remembering that. But I have to admit that that's not the only time where pride has caused me embarrassment, consternation, disappointment. And I'm sure for many of you, as you think about how pride has reared its head in your lives, you can think of times where maybe there's been an embarrassment, disappointment, or even consternation that's come from your own pride. Maybe saying something before you knew all the facts. Maybe doing something and then regretting it later. Pride seems to have a negative connotation, at least for us as Christians. On the other hand, when we think about pride, How many of us, some of you as parents, have told your parents, or told your children, be proud of your work. Take pride in your accomplishments. Don't we encourage our kids to be proud of themselves? Don't we encourage ourselves, our employees? uh, Don't we encourage, aren't we encouraged by taking pride in our accomplishments? Think about it this way. Henry Ford, when he built the Model T, he didn't just stop. He didn't just say to himself, well, we did a good job, fellas. We're all set to go. But he took pride in his work. He took pride in as many of the auto, other automakers came along. They took pride and they kept building and get, making better cars. Cars with seatbelts and airbags. Cars that were safer and faster. And here we are today. And it's not just vehicles, is it? We tell our kids to do take pride in their work in school so that they will succeed and get into good colleges. We tell our kids to, or our athletes to take pride in their accomplishments on the field that they might run faster, be uh, stronger. We even want our doctors to take pride in their work so that they will be able to provide us better prescriptions, better treatments. So is pride good or is pride bad? The Bible seems to tell us that pride is bad. In Proverbs chapter 8, 
Solomon tells us that pride comes before destruction, haughty eyes before the fall. In chapter, chapter 16, he says this, The fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. The Lord hates pride. Paul says in Galatians, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Or, my favorite, at the end of our gospel lesson for this morning, Jesus said, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So is pride a good thing or a bad thing? It seems according to God's word, pride is a bad thing. St. Augustine, one of the early church fathers, about 300 A.D. or so, very influential for the church today and very influential for Martin Luther, said that pride is the commencement, the commencement of all sin. Now what did he mean by that? Well, I think he rightly said that, first of all, it's, it's the foundation for many of the sins in our lives, but there's a double meaning there. Pride also was the very first sin. And I'm not talking about the first sin of Adam and Eve. We're getting to that one in a moment. But I'm talking even before that. The very sin that caused Satan to be cast out of heaven. Listen to the words of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground. You who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. What was the devil saying there? The devil wanted to be like God. The devil in his pride desired to take the throne of the most high. And he taught that same sin to Adam and Eve, didn't he? He taught Adam and Eve that the desire to be like God They wanted to be like God. Isn't that what it said? Knowing good from evil instead of only knowing good. And how many times have we heard about how pride has come since then? How many times have we heard about leaders who have taken pride in how great they are as emperors and fallen? Great kings have risen and fallen. Great people, presidents, have risen and fallen. That desire to be like God is the root of pride. And that is what makes pride a bad thing. That is what makes pride a sinful thing. Because it replaces God as the center of our lives and it places us squarely in the center. It replaces God as the center of the one who gives us, tells us what's right for wrong. And instead we decide what is right and wrong. What is right and wrong for us. And then we subjectively decide what is right and wrong for others. And if they don't fit into our particular opinion, our particular viewpoint, well, then they're wrong. Now, let's go back to that Pharisee in our parable for this morning. Luke 18, Jesus gives us this parable to teach us a little bit about pride. Now, I think most of us, we would not look at that Pharisee and want to compare ourselves to him. We look at him and we say, no, that's not right. We see that his heart was in the wrong place, right? more or less. But then would we really want to compare ourselves to the tax collector either? If we do that, then we look at the Pharisee and we say, thankfully I'm not. I'm not as bad as that Pharisee. And that's where pride shows up, isn't it? And I'm not, that I'm not as bad as. We look around the church and I, we say, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. We look out the church door and we say, I'm not as bad as fill in the blank. And that's how pride works. Pride isn't this overwhelming thing. Sometimes you see arrogance in an ugly way. But most of the time, it's these little bits of pride here and there. I'm not as bad as. I'm just a little better than. These comparisons where we put ourselves next to others. Putting them down. Exalting ourselves. And all of a sudden, before we realize it, when we say we're not as bad as the Pharisee, we realize, oh, that's the very sin we're falling into. And that's why that relationship it is also destructive to our relationships. A relationship with God because we, we take God out of the, as the center of our lives, but also we, our relationship with others suffer because we treat others as secondary. We treat others as not as good as ourselves. Pride leaves, uh, leads us to replace other relationships with others that are loving and caring with relationships of need and want, what they can do for us, how they can benefit us. 
And so instead of caring for others, loving others, it becomes all about us. Self-centered. Wasn't St. Augustine right? That it's the commencement of all sin. Because we know that when pride does rule our hearts and our lives, how many other sins start to take over? Well, what makes me most comfortable? What will make me most successful? Who is most important? Pride answers, I am. God answers, I am. God's Word, it answers our pride with humility. Now, humility is not any more of a pleasant conversation to have than pride. Because so often when we think of humility, we think of people who are humiliated. Like a wrestler who gets overcompensant, uh, overcompensant, who wrestles and gets pinned in the first round. We think about humility and we think about humiliation and we think about our embarrassment in front of others when we misspeak or when we do admit that we are wrong. But humility, as we look at it in God's Word, is not the same as humiliation. Humility is looking to God and admitting that we are not the rulers of our lives. We are not the center of the world, but God is the center of our lives. He is the center of the world. He is the creator of it all. When we look at humility as God explains it, it means coming before God like that tax collector, falling to our knees, beating our breast and crying out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And recognizing that we are sinners. Not just that we are sinful, but we are sinners. And then recognizing what He has done for us. Because it is humbling when we realize that we are sinners. But it's even more humbling when we realize that while we were yet sinners, Christ died on the cross for us. That while we were yet sinners, Jesus gave His life for us. And that is a humbling truth. Now our pride might want us to look at it and say, well, maybe there's something I did. But notice notice what Paul says here. For who sees anything different in any of you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? We receive this precious gift from God. We receive this wonderful gift of forgiveness. And God has given it to us passively. Well, God has given it to us actively, but we have received it passively. That gift He's given to us. Now, while it's true that all of us certainly receive this gift, are, are the same, in needing salvation. It doesn't mean that we are all exactly the same. In fact, one of the great truths that we can have is that God has created us each unique and wonderfully. And He's blessed us with different talents and abilities. Think about yourself for just a moment and the ways that God has blessed you, the gifts that God has given to you. Now this is where we tie it back to parents who encourage their kids to take pride in their schoolwork, where we encourage one another to be proud of our accomplishments. Because when we look at our lives, when we look at the talents and gifts that we are given, and we honor God with those gifts and talents, we take pride in what God is doing through us. Notice that. Let me say that again. We take pride in what God is doing through us. What God is accomplishing through our sinful hands. The way He is working despite who we are. That is the pride we have. Think about for a moment, and I don't often use the illustration of professional sports But I want to use the example of some football players that many of you have probably seen as well, where they point to the sky. Some of them point to the sky. Some of them drop down to a knee in prayer. Some of them will cross themselves. Right there, they are giving honor to God. Right there, they are honoring God for what He has done through them. Instead of taking all the credit, dancing down through the end zone with the football in hand, they are praising God for what He has done. Our lives should be constantly praising God for what He has done. And that is how we replace pride. Because we humble ourselves knowing that our sins are forgiven by the grace of God. We humble ourselves by knowing that He has blessed us with gifts and talents. And we humble ourselves by using those gifts to honor Him. So when we think of our lives, our relationships with others, humility, it comes when we share God's love. When we care for others when we share that good news that God forgave us. Humility comes when we help someone who is in need, and not because it benefits us, but because it glorifies God. Now, this isn't the same as being a doormat. This isn't the same as being walked all over. But this is loving and caring others because they need your love and care. 
because God has created us as a community. We are not individuals. Pride says that you're an individual, that it's all about you. But God says you are a community. I've created you as a community of believers, a community to live together, to care together, to share together. And when you put aside pride, you can care and love one another as God intended you to. And when you put aside pride and take that humility, then you can honor God in what you say and do. Pride honors ourselves. But humility honors God. All that we say and all that we do is meant to honor God, for that is why He created us. To honor Him, to bring praise to Him. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank You and praise You for creating us so uniquely and so wonderfully. For making us the people that we are. Lord, forgive us for those times when we allow pride to rule in our hearts and our lives. For those times when we put others down and exalt ourselves. We thank You that You have humbled Yourself. That You have come into this world taking on human flesh, dying on the cross for us, defeating death and rising again. For we know that in Your resurrection we have the promise that You have exalted us to be Your sons and Your daughters, to be Your children. Help us each day to live as Your children living lives that, not, that do not bring honor to ourselves, but instead honor you. We thank you, O Lord, that you have humbled yourself so that one day we shall rest secure with you forever in heaven. All things we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. Amen.